You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Welcome back to The Buzz. In this episode, we're asking the question, what killed the dinosaurs with Professor Phil Manning? A uh, big thanks to Phil in this episode, actually, because next week, or the week after recording this episode, he's going to climb Mount Everest. So, uh, big congratulations to him, and thank you for squeezing us in for this episode. Um, but before that, we're going to do a little quiz this time, and this time I'm asking Joe the questions. Joe, I've got a little quiz. It's called Dinosaurs or Diesaurs. <laughs> so in uh, this one, you are Very going clever. to... Oh, well, thank you. In, in this one, you're going to be uh, saying whether or not... The dinosaur name I've, uh, I, I give you is either correct or incorrect, as in, is it a real dinosaur or is it not? That sounds good to me. Yeah, I've got eight of them. So um, I think I got five out of eight on a satellite quiz, I think. I believe you did, yeah. So that's, that's the target that's the, score. That's the benchmark. That is. Okay, first up, we have got the Allosaurus. Allosaurus. Um, I'm going to go for a... That's a dinosaur. So you don't. It's not it's, a dinosaur. It's a dinosaur, but it's really di- really a dinosaur. It's oh, is it? Yeah, it's a dinosaur. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get really confusing. <laughs> it's a real dinosaur. Yeah, it's uh, they were uh, an aggressive carnivore. They, right. I think they used to hunt in packs, quite big. Right. Big as a T Rex, but yeah. Yeah. Real one. Oh, I was thinking hello, like some kind of friendly French oh. greeting. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid clearly not. Okay, so that's uh, incorrect. Uh, next up, we've got the humongosaur. Humongosaur. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like it, probably something you might have made up, so I'm going to say dinosaur. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think this through. <laughs> it isn't a dinosaur. So yes, dinosaur. Yes, yeah, so yes. It's not a dinosaur. You were correct in yes. saying that. Uh, although I didn't make it up, it's actually uh, one of Ben Ten's character. I don't even know who Ben Ten is. Oh, I've heard the name. Okay, so this is yeah, this is good because actually I I usually don't get your pop culture references. So no, this is good. Ben Ten is a cartoon series for little kids. Right. Uh, and he gets the, he's got like a watch, hmm. and he can transform into ten different characters, and one of those is the humongosaur. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, there you go. Sounds like a good watch. Yeah, you should definitely watch that. In both, in both <laughs> terms. <laughs> very, very good. Uh, next up, you've got one out of two so far. So mm, yeah. Not bad. I need to maybe up it a little bit. Yeah. We've got the Megasaurus. Megasaurus. Yeah. Uh, um, that's, it sounds almost a bit too obvious, so I'm going to say that's a dinosaur. You are correct. It isn't Get a it. real dinosaur. Uh, it is a robot one, like Chris's Cars. Right. Have you seen it? It's like a big robot one in Texas. I think it's Texas. Oh, and it crushes maybe. cars, yeah. Yeah. Sounds <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. So that is a incorrect false dinosaur that has been made up. We have got next up the <laughs> Patchy Rhinosaurus. Patchy Rhinosaurus. That is a interesting name. Uh I I'm gonna I'm gonna I don't know, but I'm gonna take a punt that it's a dinosaur. So it's not a dinosaur. Okay. Um, you are incorrect. It oh. is a dinosaur. It's a diesosaur. Right. Uh, and uh, it's quite similar, to, actually, to your favorite dinosaur, the trike. Right. Uh, so Triceratops. Looks, yeah, it looks a little bit like that. Uh, herbivore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a bit smaller. It kind of sounds a bit like rhinoceros. Yeah, it's got a it? horn. It's got a horn. Right. I think. Yeah, that's kind of why I thought no, but right, yeah. I'll have to, uh, I'll have yeah. to look, look Maybe that one up. Maybe your new favorite. <laughs> Uh, up next, we have got... So you, uh, you're on two out of four. Yeah. So not bad. You're halfway there. We've got the Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's a dino yes saw because I haven't... I don't think I've answered that one yet. And You think it's a real dinosaur? I think it's a real real dinosaur. You are correct. It is a real dinosaur. Uh, I've actually got it on my jumper. I'm not that you listeners can see my <laughs> jumper, but there's a Spino on here. It's, it's a wonderful here. jumper. It's like got a big, uh, almost like a, a ship sail right on its back. Massive oh, yeah. fin. Oh. And it's got those long yeah. bones. Yeah. Quite a famous one. Yeah, I think I've seen, yeah. I've seen that. It's almost like, it's like a like a hand fan. Yeah, 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 definitely. So yes, that was a dinosaur. Uh, next up, we've got the Argentinosaurus. Argentinosaurus. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've heard of any that kind of place name related so i'm I'm going to take a guess that it's a dinosaur it's 
Oh, this is so confusing. It, it's a real dinosaur, I'm afraid, so oh. you're incorrect. Uh, and yeah, it was found in Argentina, so that's right. why it's called Ar- Argentinosaurus. Don't have any more information, Creative. I'm afraid, yeah. <laughs> uh, two more to go. I think you get both of these to, to draw level, I think, so... Oh. Yeah. Tough. You're not keeping score. <laughs> I was, but I've, 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 yeah, I've lost track. Uh, we've got the Corosaurus. Now, Cora sounds a lot like your name, Corey. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> so, and knowing how much you love dinosaurs, I'm going to say that's a dinosaur. You are correct. I did make it up, and I made it up because it sounds like my name, the Corysaurus. <laughs> not quite. Um, One day. This is the make or break. You can draw a level with me, or you could lose. It yep. is the Korea Ceratops. Korea Ceratops. The Korea Ceratops. Um, I think that sounds like it, it, it could be a dinosaur. I'm going to say die. Die, yes, sir. You are correct. It's a real dinosaur. It Get is, it. I think, again, found in Korea. Right. Um, so, Joe, you got, I think, five out of eight. If you haven't, then yeah, the users will... I, I think I did. Okay. Which so, is what you got in the yeah, previous episode. It's so. drawing level, so... Yeah, we're level pegging. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, I hope you maybe were playing along at home. If you do, let me know if you got more than Joe's five. But, um, yeah. Impossible. <laughs> well, let's hope... I don't even know how to respond to that, Joe. <laughs> uh, one person who will know his dinosaurs from his die yes saws is Phil Manning, and here's that interview with him. So we are joined by Professor Phil Manning to talk about dinosaurs, and the first question we have, Phil, is what killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> Boredom. No, I don't know. <laughs> and they've been around for 165 million years and said, that's long enough. Mm-hmm. No, I think there's, this is one of those perennial questions that we get and it's it's one which we try and answer as succinctly as possible so here we go a large rock roughly the size of mount everest which is large in my mind at the moment um (laughs) smashed into the earth at approximately 60 to seventy thousand kilometers an hour creating a 180 kilometer wide crater which is just beneath the surface in northern yucatan peninsula mexico and that's the impact site. It dates from 66.1 million years ago, and that would have given a lot of headaches to anything locally. But it's the subsequent ejection of material from the impact itself up into the upper atmosphere, circulating around the globe, changing weather patterns, and the rest is kind of natural history. It's, um, we see the extinction not only of dinosaurs, multiple other groups. But it's a small, one of the smallest of the big five mass extinction events. But um, that's, that's the short answer. But there was lots of other things going on as well. And in northwest Indian, the Deccan traps, these are not places which trap Deccans because they're not a being, it's an area. And the traps are referring to basaltic lava flows of thousands of square kilometers, which were erupting out from the core of the earth at that time over the period when the dinosaurs became extinct. And what do they produce? Greenhouse gases. Mm. So you've got multiple facets which are modeling and changing the earth's atmosphere which is affecting all life on earth and uh what time scale are we talking about i assume it wasn't a week the asteroid came a week later all dinosaurs are gone well it's interesting you say that there's the (laughs) that i think the impact was so rapid that it probably was a, a matter of days weeks and months to see a majority of the effects of that impact event so <laughs> it, it this is why we call it a pulse mass extinction it's one of these really rapid mm. extinction events so rapid in fact the only one that we can compare it to in the evolution of all life on earth is the one that we're sleepy sleepwalking into at the moment um, which of course is the sixth mass extinction because we've seen over a thousand species go extinct in in as many years and that's catastrophic for our planet's ecosystem. So we're actually living through a very similar event now. Um, it's funny because we only live a short period of time. It doesn't seem as drastic as it might be, but it is. Hmm. So how do, we, how, how do we know that that's what caused the, the, the end of the dinosaurs? Well, the nice thing is there's lots of evidence. When you, the big gaping hole, uh, which we call the Chicxulub crater, is a, is a, is a, is a good starting point. <laughs> But also there's some chemistry that can help us. And everyone loves a bit of chemistry. Mm-hmm. I can see people thinking, actually, no. But, but you, can, <laughs> you can. You can come to love chemistry, I promise. <laughs> In this case, it's a platinum group element. Platinum's nice. But this one is a very rare um, 
platinum group. It's called iridium. It's found on asteroids, meteorite, meteoritic material, and deep in the core's Earth. Um, when the Earth was still quite a molten sort of lump some four billion odd years ago, a lot of the iridium got drawn to the core of the Earth. And so it's very rare at the Earth's surface. So when we find it at the Earth's surface, you've got to find a mechanism. It can either be volcanism, so huge eruptive eruptions, pushing some iridium from the Earth's core onto the surface, or it can be from impacts. And because the impact debris doesn't only have iridium, which is a perfect chemistry, a signature for saying this has come from a, a meteorite, there's also things called shocked quartz. Now, I got this vision of a, a quartz crystal sat in the corner, shivering, <laughs> shocked. But no, it's, it's because it's such energy has gone through the latticework, the actual structure of the quartz has changed. And it's called a shocked quartz grain. And we get billions of those associated with the iridium anomaly. And this supports, it gives us evidence in which we can build our hypothesis that there was something that smashed into the Earth, and it dates perfectly with this large crater on the Yucatan Peninsula. Hmm. And um, I guess, so did all the dinosaurs die out, or are there still animals today that kind of evolved from dinosaurs? Oh, thank you. I am so glad you asked that question. <laughs> clearly, clearly you've been reading your books, and I'm very <laughs> pleased. Yes, I'm a great supporter of the RSPD, yes, the Royal Society for Protection of dinosaurs because <laughs> our feathered friends flapping around outside are derived avian theropods that means basically direct descendants of of predatory dinosaurs so when when someone sees a t-rex in a museum i look out of my my uh, window into the garden and i see a blackbird i see a t-rex relative <laughs> And we just call them birds, but birds, there's over 10,000 species. Dinosaurs are still heroically uh, successful as, as a group. You know, I, I, I often joke that the mass extinction 66 million years ago was the mistaken extinction because d dinosaurs are still with us today. If the um, kind of mass extinction event hadn't have happened, and uh, would we be here today as, as humans? No. we've lived alongside them <laughs> no no simple that's the easiest question i hate, hate giving a, a no to a to a, such a it, it, it's an important question and obviously the the course that evolution took after the mass extinction of dinosaurs it completely reset the equilibrium and ecosystems across the whole of the planet and you have what's called competitive space. It's like, it's like evolutionary Olympics. And m all life on Earth was then competing to occupy these ecological niches which had been filled with some incredibly successful animals. I mean, dinosaurs evolved first 230 million years ago. And for 165 million years, that's a long time. Our evolutionary history is... is, 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 is vacuous compared to that mm. so they were highly successful so the, there was a huge amount of ecological space for life to take advantage of and the mammals were just perfectly positioned in so many ways to take advantage of that space otherwise we'd not be having this conversation today um and uh, i guess um backtracking a little bit it seems like uh with birds in my head they don't look like traditional dinosaurs so what what makes that a dinosaur? What is a I guess what is a dinosaur? Well, what? that's a good question. Remember, the whole of life on Earth, as we interpret it, is an artificial construct of humans. We like to um, quantify and qualify what we're looking at through the different scientific tools that have been deployed over the last two centuries, especially. The Victorians were absolutely obsessed <laughs> with categorizing life on Earth and trying to understand the relationship of one organism to another. And of course, the seminal work by good old Charles Darwin and that beautiful sketch, which has now been refound on the library floor, um, that sketch, the first phylogeny, that first family tree of life. Um, we're now beginning to piece together, not only using just the shape and form of extinct animals, we're using molecular phylogenies. We're using all the tools and techniques that we can deploy here at the University of Manchester to really piece together an amazing story of this this complex tapestry of life on Earth. And um, to be perfectly honest, um, that our understanding of those evolutionary relationships is getting better day by day. And I've forgotten the original question because I'm going off on one because I love talking about <laughs> That's evolution. Okay. The, the, the question <laughs> is, what is a dinosaur? Well, the, the, it's a construct as a function of that, that tapestry. Mm. So we have to define, you need this, this, this and this. It's like if you're, if you're, if you're going down the road, you spot a, a mini 
you, you've already assimilated in your mind that that car has all of the characters that make it a Mini. And if you see a, um, a Fiat um, Panda, you'll know instantly that's a Fiat Panda. You are assessing morphological characters. That's precisely what we do with, with All Life on Earth. And we've set the characters that define what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. And if you tick the right boxes, then you get sat and categorized in those groups. And there's two major groups within a dinosauria. That is the Saurischian or Sauriscian dinosaurs, the lizard-hipped, and the Ornithischian or the bird-hipped dinosaurs. All dinosaurs you know and love fit in there, even birds. And birds, of course, fit into the lizard hip dinosaurs because they're just awkward. That's the way it works. Mm -hmm. it, it seems with the, the kind of the mass extinction event, that's quite an accepted um, explanation for what happened. Has that kind of always been the case for a long time? Or was there any other theories before then that people believed to be true? There was other hypotheses out there. And it's very important to, to just to do the hypothesis theory thing. Theory is something that's wonderful. It's been supported by large quantities of evidence that's nudged into that one. We have a theory of gravity. You can go and test it if you want. It, it's, it's very reliable. And um, it's something which when you drop something, it's drawn. Gravity works. And so theories are something which are tried, tested, and evidence-based. Um, hypotheses, though, can actually turn out to be completely wrong. <laughs> and, um, and, and there's many of those in the past. So we, we always be careful with regards to when we're saying hypotheses or, or theories. Sorry, back to your question. What was your question again? Sorry. Uh, were, were, were there any kind of hypotheses that kind of before we had all the, the evidence for the mass extinction event that oh, yes. were now accepted? There's some really fun ones. Everything from big game hunters, aliens <laughs> coming down from space, fishing for dinosaurs, um, gene pool drainage by little mammalian egg eaters. Um, got too hot, got too cold, got, um, which probably was a bit of that going on at some points. Um, everything from oh, it's, it, every, fern oils being poisonous, causing breakdowns in ecosystems, spores causing breakdowns, viruses, you know, every single idea has been put out there as to why the dinosaurs. But there's a kind of a glaring sort of the, the, the gaping hole in the room is, is the Chicxulub crater that dates perfectly at this point in time. So it's kind of redundant ha having a lot of these other ideas because uh, the evidence is hard to collect, collect for it or it doesn't exist, whereas there's huge amounts of evidence supporting the impact hypothesis. Mm, it seems there's almost quite a lot of science fiction around dinosaurs, right? So you've got Jurassic Park and you've got uh, other kind of dinosaurs that seemingly come back to life is is that completely science fiction or are we getting closer to that being maybe a possibility we will never bring back extinct dinosaurs because the material building blocks we'd need to do that are just not preserved through deep time we might get a few disjointed sentences and occasional letters from the complex volume that is the genome of a dinosaur um, even then, we're not even sure if it's come from a dinosaur. It could have been from some contamination and samples. So you might think, I'm sequencing a T-Rex, and you, you sequence it, you've got a blue bottle fly. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit disappointing, unless you like blue bottle flies. So it's, it's, what we can do, though, is we look at the descendants of the dinosaurs, the birds. And in their genome, they still have a lot of genes which have been switched off in evolutionary terms for, for millennia. And you've probably heard of the phrase as rare as hen's teeth. And that's where, during development, the gene responsible for growing socketed teeth, which has been switched off for 66 million years, um, is, is turned on by a specific chemistry being present during development. And that gene is expressed, and you get the phenotypical expression, the physical expression of the gene, which is teeth. So hence the term rare as hen's teeth. It does still happen, but you could genetically engineer a dinosaur, but it would be a new species and very, very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> In this season of The Buzz, we're asking our academics for their favourite things about our favourite city, which is, of course, Manchester. We've mentioned Manchester quite a lot in the conversation, but what we'd like to know is what's your favourite thing to do in Manchester? <laughs> oh gosh, favourite thing to do in Manchester. Um, gosh, it's really hard. Work is my life. So everything I've done at Manchester, I, <laughs> I always say brought up in Somerset but made in Manchester. 
I've spent 30 years of my career here. And um, what I do and enjoy most at Manchester is my work. Great. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> uh, who, if you have one, who is your favourite Manchester-related person? Andy Burnham. I think <laughs> Andy Burnham is a complete rock star. And if, if, if by any chance he gets to hear this, if he ever wants to go out with, with him, any member of his family want to come out collecting dinosaurs, I would find space for you on any of my dig teams. Because whenever I hear that gentleman speak, he speaks sense. And I just wish more politicians were like that. Great, great. <laughs> well, let's hope he will listen. Maybe yeah, great I'm invitation. sure he does. I'm sure he does. And um, what's what's your favourite Manchester building? Oh gosh, um, I suppose I'm going to have to be going for the John Ryland's Library at mm. Deansgate because I. It's funny. I, I it was I first went there about 25, 30 years ago, and I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was and and it had two of my favorite things books and architecture and they're perfectly melded into one space and uh, yeah john ryland's library beautiful super uh, final question for me uh what is your favorite place to eat in manchester crow <laughs> <laughs> now if you don't crow on oxford road is a tradition for in our department uh, we're, we're quite close to the crow bar and and it always makes me giggle. Um, I'm I'm half English, half Danish. My mum's Danish, and crawl is is a Danish word that means bar, effectively. <laughs> okay. So it's the crow bar. So it's the bar bar, which always <laughs> makes me laugh. But they have Danish food in there, which I love. So I can get my frakadella, my risalama, whatever, and it's really good. And um, that's that's so much amazing science has been hatched in the hallowed halls <laughs> sure. of what was a temperance society at one point, which always makes me giggle. Um, yes, Crow. Crow is one of my favourite places. Brilliant to think what what comes from a conversation in the in the pub. Uh, so our, our final question is, can you describe Manchester in three words? Manchester in three words. Crikey. Um, that's That's a really tough thing to do. I I would innovative would be one which I think would be very fair. Um, oh gosh, I I that's something I would have to think about. But from the, from the I I would say it's a warm place. People make fun of the the rain and stuff here, but it's warm. The people have been here the most welcoming and kind, friendly people I have ever had the pleasure, and I. I don't sound like a northerner, but I've lived here longer than anywhere else in my life. And I think Manchester gives me a warm feeling. The Danes have a word for that, by the way. It's called hygge. Wow. And uh, hygge is this feeling of feeling that you're, you belong somewhere. And so maybe it's either warm or hygge. Hygge is a good word sure. for Manchester. Hygge is a great word. Yeah. And, and I just... I'm just trying to, I, I don't want to just to sh sell Manchester short. Three words, it's tough. Mm. But um, I think aspirational as well, because you can come here, be anything, do anything, and they'll give you as much rope as you need. And that's what I've loved about Manchester, where I don't think I would have got the support elsewhere that I have at Manchester. So you can be really aspirational and achieve things you can't do anywhere else, aspirational. Um, so we know that you've been doing some amazing sounding work in uh, Wyoming. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about how that's coming along? Well, the Wyoming work is, is, is great fun. We've, we've been playing with the giant sauropod dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation. And I should have learned better because, you know, these bones are bigger than I am. And when you start moving multi-ton bones around in the field, it can be pretty brutal hard work. But, but thankfully for us, the project's gone really well the last four to five years, and two giant sauropods have just gone on display at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, who we've been working with on this really fun project. But, but the other project, which is more relevant really for the extinctions, is a little bit further north. We've been working in North Dakota at a new site called Tanis. And uh, it's nicknamed Tanis just because you could give a site a name and 
We all like Indiana Jones. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> you remember that scene when he's putting the staff into the in the tomb, getting the beam of light? Shine? That was Tannis. Anyway, um, the the work we're doing up at the Tannis site is looking at this moment in time when the dinosaurs became extinct. And we've been over the moon that the last, oh, crikey, year or two, we've been working with a team from the BBC who've made a wonderful documentary with, with um, the god of natural history. Mm. Yes, he who can be named as, <laughs> as Sir David Attenborough, who is one of the most amazing human beings on the planet. And, and he's breathed life into the bones of these very old dinosaurs for us. And that program will be going out over Easter. And we're quite excited about that. But, um, but we're, we're now allowed to talk to people about this, this, this program and also um, where the research is going because the discoveries we've made at the Tannis site are helping us completely rethink our understanding of what happened on the last day of the dinosaurs. Such is the remarkable preservation at this site of the first few hours of events encapsulated in stone from literally seconds after when the meteorite first struck and the subsequent hours, we have the first true record that I've ever seen, it's breathtaking, of what happened to the organisms of what was then the Hell Creek Formation and how they've been preserved and all this new stuff they can tell us. This is great. Hmm. No, it sounds really interesting. Beyond just it being really interesting and, and fascinating to do, is there any particular reason why you would be doing research onto the, 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 this period of time? Well, I, it's funny. When, when you're hiking up into the hills and you look over your shoulder regularly, not to enjoy the view, but it's so when you're coming back down, you can know where you're going. You know, that hindsight's really powerful. Um, as we move forward as a species through time into from our present to the future, um, some of us might look over our shoulder to think, oh, should I have done that? <laughs> as a species, we're rather good at messing things up, you see. And there's quite a lot being said about, should we have done that? What was that thing? Oh, yes, the Industrial Revolution. Oops. And it's, it's had a major impact on our climate. And that hindsight, which we're trying to deal with at the moment and plan for, is, 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 is challenging, to say the least. But if you go further back in time, into the fossil record, we can see these challenges which have hit life on Earth over the millennia and how life has dealt with these challenges and what possibly could be done to aid and abet our understanding of what's happening to ecosystems today so we don't face, should we say, some of the disastrous consequences we see in the fossil record that we might be able to avert. Basically, Fossil record gives us hindsight, hindsight that we can use to plan for the present and hopefully for the future as well. So by studying extinction events, we might better prepare and deal with and prevent the mass extinction event we're walking into at the moment. Hmm. The, the work you're doing today, is has there been a kind of major developments technology-wise that's allowed you to do more than you would have done previously? Oh, oh, absolutely. The University of Manchester is the bat cave of science. <laughs> I mean, you, you always watch Batman go into these amazing sort of caves with all the tech and stuff that they can do, which is usually quite ridiculous. But we have our equivalent with the imaging tech that is present within the University of Manchester's research suites is second to none. We can do science here that would be very difficult at any other institution. Um, the X-ray imaging work we do with Phil Withers and his team across the material science and Royce is is astounding what we can see. We can pick apart the literal building blocks of, of the molecules comprising our fossils, even if we take them down to the Manchester beamline at the Diamond light source or work at the other spectroscopy beamlines at Diamond. We do a lot of collaborative work with Stanford University at their synchrotron as well. Basically, we try and use what is the most up-to-date highest resolution tech that will allow us to see and interpret what we're picking apart in terms of these beautiful fossils because they deserve to be studied with as, as much resource and as carefully as possible so that we can really unpick some of these incredible stories cool and when we're 
I guess when we're looking for dinosaur fossils, what are some of the the key things that make fossils good? Like, how do we preserve? How are they preserved well in the in the archaeology? It's interesting. The oh, archaeology, paleontology. Sure, <laughs> archaeology <laughs> deals with that wonderful veneer of history of life, uh, life, our lives as in humans. But we deal with the older stuff. Usually, paleo is anything over fifty thousand years old. But but the the way in which we can use this technology to peel apart new um, questions um, is, 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 I hate to admit this, but I'm going to say it. I'll, my colleagues will thump me for this. A lot of the science is actually a fishing trip. You're, you're, you're using techniques, you're, you're delving into the depths of an area which you're not familiar with, and occasionally you get a really good bite. And there's a lot of the science that we've been developing at Manchester which has allowed us to do that. And some of these bites have applications not only for our own science but for multiple other areas too and that's one of the really important things to take home from the type of science that does happen here at Manchester. I, an example that's really interesting is that well, when you bury something in the ground you question what is a fossil. Up until when I was an undergraduate a fossil was something that was a, a ghost, a, a mirror, a replica of something that was once living. But because of the imaging tech that we've been deploying now, we can, for the first time, say, well, actually, no. Sorry, I'm going to quote Jurassic Park. Something has survived. And something in the original chemistry. When you pick up a dinosaur bone, the calcium and the phosphate in the bone, that hydroxyapatite, is still there. The mineral component of the bone that was built by the organism, organism while it was still alive is still present. So... What we've got to understand, though, is what has entered that system, what has moved in, what has moved out. And this is what chemists call mass transfer. And this is really important because if you want to put things in the ground today and tell your children and children's children that it's safe, you've got to understand mass transfer. And say it's nuclear waste and you want to bury it so it's not going to harm anyone. Um, you've got to do it in ways which are going to keep it in one place for a long time. Well, that's a fossil. Think about it. Because fossils are preserved through deep time. And they're, they're like these beautiful examples of what happens when you bury something in the ground. So if we can learn from what's called taphonomy, taphos, nomos, burial laws, of, with a fossil, we can apply that knowledge to what we're looking at for disposal of nasty things in the present day so that they don't harm us or other life on Earth. So the fossil record truly can help us learn about the preservation of fossils, but also how we might make the planet a safer place for humans in the future and other life on Earth. What would you say to any kind of budding paleontologist who might be listening to this? Would you, what, what encouragement would you give to them or uh, advice, I guess, would you give to them? <laughs> now, I'm a, I'm a professor of natural history. I'm not a professor of paleontology. The reason I'm professor of natural history is because the subjects that I deal with now include chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, mathematics, computing. I can go on. There is anyone who's out there who's interested in unpicking the story of life on Earth. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You don't have to be just a paleontologist. I want to hear from engineers, physicists, chemists, people who really can shed a different angle on our understanding of, of past life. So really, my message is to everyone out there, if you've ever thought of working in the field of paleontology, you, you have skills already which are unique to you. How might you apply those to my field? And that's the kind of folks we want to hear from. A big thank you to Professor Phil Manning for today's episode and for answering what killed the dinosaurs. You can catch Phil and the team on the recent BBC documentary, The Last Day of the Dinosaurs. Next time on The Buzz, we're looking at the explosive topic of volcanoes. Remember, if you want to get in touch with The Buzz team, you can email fscmarketing at manchester.ac.uk. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at UOM Sai Eng, and we're also on Facebook. We'll see you next time on The Buzz.